Welcome back to Telltale Books. This is going to be a topic video on something that I thought, because I'm doing all of these authors' complete works series, and, and most of them are science fiction authors, and most of them I'm um, reading stories that appeared in different science fiction magazines over the years, it started occurring to me that today's readers may not be very familiar with what I'm talking about. That there are still science fiction magazines, but they're not like they used to be. There has been a big shift in the genre. There has been a big shift in the readership. And the way things used to be done just aren't done anymore. And so I thought I'd do a a video kind of going over the whole history of the science fiction magazines um, very quickly, not, not getting into too much detail, but giving you some background of what I'm talking about. And maybe you'll know a little, little better some of the names I throw around you know, when I talk about amazing stories. What is amazing stories? So, of course, science fiction, a lot of people considered to have started with Frankenstein, which was published as a novel. Um, a lot of novels back then in the early 1800s were published in parts, you know, so you'd have to buy all the pieces before you get the whole novel. Uh, Charles Dickens did a lot of that. By Charles Dickens' time, in the middle of the 1800s, and, and even in Edgar Allan Poe's time in, in the late 1830s, early 1840s, you had a lot of magazines showing up. A lot of them were daily, some of them weekly. Monthly was not so common back then. Most of them were more often that than that, and they did buy fiction and, and poetry, and they would publish it along with other articles. And so the magazine was born, and magazine fiction was born. Um, Jules Verne published all published mostly novels, but everything he published, novels and short stories, he published in magazines first. His novels were were published in serial form, you know, one piece per month, even either in three parts or four parts. Sometimes they were shorter and only got two parts. Um, sometimes really long stuff would get eight parts, depending on the magazine. Some of those magazines were kind of slim. So they'd have to break a, a novel up into a lot more parts to publish it. And some of them published weekly, some of them published daily, some of them published monthly. So Jules Verne published all of his work as serials in these magazines before they were published as books. And H.G. Wells did the same thing. He published you know, all the short stories went in the magazines like Pall Mall Gazette or I'm um, trying to think of some of the others. They were published in magazine form. Now with Wells, Wells couldn't leave well, well enough and all, alone. Um, he would publish his novels in serial form in the magazines, and then he would go and revise the whole damn thing before he published it as a novel. And he did that to a lot of his short stories, too. He published the short stories, but then before he collected them together into a, a book collection, um, he went and rewrote them. <laughs> so now they're different. And in some cases, like The Time Machine in particular, there's like seven different versions of that story that he wrote. But he published a lot in the magazines, at least in the earlier part of his career, which is when most of his science fiction and fantasy works were published. Later on, he was publishing a, a lot of um, more contemporary type fiction, as well as lots and lots of nonfiction. And most of those went straight to book because he was so successful. But he still did once in a while appear in magazines. And uh, authors like Algernon Blackwood and 
and William Hope Hodgson published in small magazines. After 1900, and more, and I'm not exactly sure ex just when it started, but sometime before World War I, a magazine came along called Argosy, and another one called All Story Weekly, and that's where you find most of Edgar Rice Burroughs and A. Merritt publishing in those magazines, and eventually they would merge in the 1920s. Um, but there was a lot of the early weird fiction that was published in, in Argosy and All Story Weekly. And that's where you're going to find the, the original publications of Tarzan and John Carter of Mars and The Moon Pool by Abraham Merritt. And then comes 1923. Um, and actually in 1919, the world's first horror magazine was published in one of the Scandinavian countries, and I forget the name of it. And it it didn't last long, but it's technically the first. So you gotta acknowledge Weird Tales was not the first horror magazine to ever be published. But it was the first successful one. It was the first one people really took notice of. It was the first one to last. And it started publishing in 1923. I forget the exact month. Um, I think it was February. Because we just hit the 100th anniversary of Weird Tales. And Weird Tales kept publishing on a regular basis all the way into the 1950s, at which time financial troubles caused it to go into this thing where it's kind of on again, off again, always. The most recent incarnation of Weird Tales was still being published as recently as 2021. And it appears that has... It, it appears that version of it has again ceased publication. So we'll see if it actually comes back again. This year would have been a good time to bring it back, but nobody did. So um, Weird Tales has kept going kind of on and off all the way up to the, almost the present day, making it the oldest of all of them. And they published a lot of great authors, of course, H.P. Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, Clark Ashton Smith, but you also had authors like um, Murray Leinster and Henry Kuttner, Edmund Hamilton, Seal Moore, they were all publishing in Weird Tales as well. So that is the first of the really great, great, great genre, you know, imaginative genre magazines to be published and succeed. Now, shortly after that, in 1926, April of 1926, Hugo Gernsback launched Amazing Stories. Now, you have to understand, Hugo Gernsback had been publishing magazines for a while, um, Science and Mechanics, as well as, I think one was called Radio Experimenter, and he had a number of other titles that dealt with science or or radio technology. He was heavily into radio and uh, published a lot of magazines with articles about science. And in those magazines, he published some science fiction. And so in, in 1926, he decided to launch Amazing Stories to dedicate entirely to science fiction. And, and the, the first couple of years of Amazing Stories 90% of what was published was just reprinting H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, Edgar Allan Poe, Edgar Rice Burroughs. So you didn't see a lot of new fiction coming along. And it wasn't, it wasn't, you did see some here and there though, start in um, later in 1926. And, and in 27, 28, you had some new fiction, like the, he published the first story of Jack Williamson, The Metal Man. So he, he was publishing some new fiction, but not a lot. And maybe it's because there just weren't a lot of writers writing specifically this kind of thing. I mean, 
Yeah, sure, H.G. Wells was out there, and he was super, super famous in the world at that time. But there weren't a lot of writers trying to emulate H.G. Wells. So there wasn't a lot. There were some, but there wasn't a lot of writers to draw from. Mostly what Gernsback attracted were teenagers that read his early issues of his magazine, and they said, wow, I want to write that too, and they tried. And for lack of anything better, Gernsback published them. Some of them wrote some good stories. A lot of the stories were not, they were interesting, but they weren't um, really professional work. But they, but the authors were teenagers, so come on. You know, it, a rocky start. Gotta start somewhere. But Gernsback lost control of Amazing Stories by 1929 and he went off and started some new magazines, um, originally Science Wonder Stories and Air Wonder Stories, which were later combined into just Wonder Stories. So when you hear me talking about those, that was what Gernsback did to get back in the game. And he did a good job. Wonder Stories kept going for, for a few more years before, once again, Gernsback lost control and, and uh, the Thrilling Group bought Wonder Stories and changed the name to Thrilling Wonder Stories. Because, hey, it's not, a mon it's not enough to, for them to be wonder stories. they got to be thrilling wonder stories. you got to really, really hit home that this is something that you got to read. <laughs> um, so, Amazing Stories was the first science fiction magazine, and, and this is one of the early issues. This is the January 1929 issue. This is an actual copy that I've bought. Um... This one I was actually able to afford, but it was still pretty pricey. These old issues in this kind of condition, they go for a lot of money. And so getting anything before 1929 has been, you know, they're out there, but I can't afford them. So this is an actual issue. January 1929, amazing stories. And yes, it was, it's what they call a bedsheet magazine. It's a, a bigger magazine than what we're used to for science fiction magazines, which you'll see in a, in a bit. But you still do have bedsheet magazines published today. They're just not as popular because they're a little more difficult to read. Um, but this one has a beautiful, beautiful cover by Frank R. Paul. One of his, he did a lot of really crappy work, but this is one of his brilliant paintings. It's, it's just mind blowing mind-blowingly beautiful and this issue of amazing comes from this is january 1951 and um, you can see a much different magazine by then you know a long way away from gernsback's original but it was still in publication still publishing stories um, around this time it was much much more your typical pulp magazine though not not publishing the best science fiction anymore. In 1929, Amazing was publishing a lot of the very best work. By 1951, they, you know, Robert Arnett is the author of the cover story that's illustrated on that one. Um, I don't really know anything about Robert Arnett because he's such a minor, minor writer in science fiction history. So Amazing fell far by 1951. They were able to pull back up in the 1960s, especially under the editorship of Celie Goldsmith. Um, she took Amazing and its companion magazine, Fantastic, and started, she discovered a lot of great, great authors. She published a lot of Harlan Ellison, Fritz Lieber. Um, she published the first stories of Ursula Le Guin. She really, really found a lot of awesome authors to put in, in a amazing science fiction by that time and uh, kept the magazine going and amazing kept going um, pretty healthy till the end of the 1970s where it, when it ran into trouble uh, and then well it was bought by one group and kept going for a couple issues and then it was bought by TSR Inc one of my former employers and the company that brought you Dungeons and Dragons originally that was Gary Gygax's company and so in, in the early 1980s, he bought Amazing Stories and 
really revived it, brought in some excellent other editors, and got some really, really amazing writers back in again. Um, you know, published a lot of the very, very best stories of the 1980s in amazing stories, and, and kept it going in, until the early 90s. And then it kind of disappeared for a while, and, and then when um, Wizards of the Coast took over all of TSR's properties, they revised amazing stories and kept it going um, into the 2000s, I think most of the way to 2010, and then it, it went to another company that tried to get it going, kept it going for a few years and failed, and then another company more recently tried to revive it again. They published, I don't know, seven, eight issues, and in 2022, they stopped publishing new issues. And so now Amazing is once again in limbo. So it's kind of gone the way like Weird Tales did, where it, it keeps trying to come back but never can really succeed. But the Amazing Stories is a huge part of science fiction history, and it really, really has, even though there have been other magazines getting better work, Amazing Stories really did hang in there and publish some awesome, awesome science fiction over the years. Now, as I said, Wonder Stories, I don't have a, any copies of Wonder Stories, but it became Thrilling Wonder Stories, and it kept going into the mid-1950s, and this is one of the later issues with a beautiful Ed Emsch cover. I bought this mainly because of this cover. I love this illustration. Um, the authors listed on the cover, Fletcher Pratt, Joel Townsend Rogers, George O. Smith, good authors, but not very well known today. Um, but like I say, I bought this for the illustration. When I saw this illustration online, I said, I gotta have that issue, and so I immediately tracked down a copy. It's not the best copy, really, but it's the best I could find that day to purchase, so I purchased it. And this is the April 1952 issue, so not the end of, of their history, but getting there. Um, so thrilling wonder stories, and, and there was a companion magazine, Startling Stories, that they both got going um, in the late 1930s and kept going for quite a while. And, and they actually also have had modern revivals. And so did Planet Stories, which got going in, uh, I believe, 1938 or 39, and they kept going steadily into the mid-1950s. And there have been recent modern attempts to revive Planet Stories as well, which didn't go too far. So, um, but before those magazines came along, in January of 1930, was founded Astounding Stories of Super Science. Um, and the stories at that time were what you would expect for a magazine with that title. But of course, it la later on, became under under the editorship of John W. Campbell, and he changed the name to Astounding Science Fiction. He wanted to change it to just science fiction, but before he could get the owners of the magazine, Street and Smith, to agree to that, somebody else started publishing a magazine titled Just Science Fiction, and so he lost out on that one. I do have here one of the early issues of Astounding, of Campbell's Astounding. I don't have any earlier than this one myself. This is from December of 1938, so it's shortly after Campbell took over, and, and the cover story is for a story by Al Sprague de Camp, who became one of Campbell's important authors. And uh, in the early 40s, you had a number of other magazines crop up, like Stirring Science Stories and, and Astonishing Stories, and like I said, Planet Stories. And they were successful for a short time, but the war caused shortages, including paper shortages. And a lot of magazines had to cease publication because of the paper shortages. Some of them came back after the war, some didn't. But 
during the war and until like 1947, 48, there was a lull in the science fiction magazines. There wasn't a whole lot of them around. You had the big ones like Amazing and Astounding and, and Thrilling Wonder. They were hanging on, um, but most of the rest disappeared. But with the interest in rocketry, the Von Braun um, V2 rockets, and the sudden explosion of interest in UFOs, people started taking notice of science and space and taking an interest. And so you had a lot of science fiction magazines, or a lot of science fiction movies being made all of a sudden. Publishers suddenly wanted a lot of science fiction books for their um, book lines. And you had an explosion, a, a literal explosion of, of titles of science fiction magazines. There's no way I could list them all. Um, two of the earliest to come about were Galaxy Science Fiction, which was an excellent magazine, published some of the very, very best science fiction, especially in the 1950s, and it was able to keep going all the way until 1979 when Galaxy closed down. And the other one that got started about the same time as Galaxy is the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Um, I, have an, I have a lot of old issues of fantasy and science fiction, but it was convenient to grab the one, this one. And in particular, I love the cover. Um, I've got, this is a, this issue, it looks like it's brand new. It's the September 1958 issue of Fantasy and Science Fiction with a cover by the great Ed M. Schweller. Um, I'll try to get it so you can see that illustration a little better. Uh, illustrating Have Spacesuit Will Travel by Robert Heinlein. Okay. The magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, you know, you can, you can see by the authors listed on the bottom of this, Robert A. Heinlein, Robert Block, John Collier, they really did publish both fantasy and science fiction. And they published a lot of the greatest. They published Jerome Bixby's um, It's a Good Life. They published a lot of Carol M. Schwiller's stories and a lot of Judith Merrill's stories. They published a lot of Robert Heinlein in the 1950s. They published Asimov. Asimov wrote a science column for fantasy and science fiction starting in the 19, I think the very early 1960s, and he published every month without fail until he died. He had his science column in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and that was one of the big reasons why I became a subscriber to fantasy and science fiction and um, and kept reading it for a lot of years. And I am, well, fantasy and science fiction is one of them that's still going today. As is astounding, except in 1960, Campbell changed the name of astounding to analog science fiction science fact, and it is still being published as analog science fiction in fact this is the may june 2023 issue with a cover that i absolutely am in love with and i am a current subscriber of analog so i keep getting those and i'm also a current subscriber of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction this is their um, most recent issue with again a really beautiful fantasy cover for a, a traditional fantasy sword and sorcery kind of story by Matthew Hughes and so these these magazines are still going a couple of the others that that started um, well one of the others that started in the 1950s and unfortunately didn't last um, out of the 1950s, but it published a lot of great, great stories and great authors. It's Infinity. This issue happens to have a, a story by Harlan Ellison, which I bought um, 
once again, Ed M. Schwiller on the cover. Um, so Infinity was a really good magazine, but just didn't have staying power. Another one that was published, and this was edited by Frederick Pohl. And that was Worlds of Tomorrow, which lasted through most of the 19, through the 1960s. It got started in 63, I think, and lasted until 1971. So it, it had a good run, but it's not around anymore, which is unfortunate, because they, too, published some great work. This one contains the first publication of Larry Niven's World of Tavs, his first novel. And also has Harlan Ellison. I mean, not Harlan, yeah, not Harlan Ellison, Brian W. Always. Um, and another one, this one started up in the 1940s and is more of a pulp magazine, but was a little better than what was being published in Amazing. But it's, this too, I believe, was a Ziff Davis magazine. I'm looking to see if it says on, on here anyway. Um, so I think it was a companion to Amazing Stories, but they had some really co cool covers and some Fritz Lieber, excellent authors. And that's Fantastic Adventures magazine, which eventually they did away with Fantastic Adventures. Um, before they did away with Fantastic Adventures, they started a magazine that was just called Fantastic. And eventually they phased out Fantastic Adventures and just had Fantastic. And that one, again, ran all the way to the late 1970s. Now, in the, in the 1970s, in the late 1970s, as all these um, major old magazines were going out of business, you had some, some new magazines start up. One of the best ones was Galileo Magazine. This contains the first story by John Kessel. Um, Galileo Magazine also published the serialization of Masters of Solitude by Marvin Kaye and the serialization of the Ringworld Engineers by Larry Niven. And they, they again did, they did, um, it's almost bedsheet size, so it's a big magazine and lavishly illustrated, beautiful magazine. Unfortunately, that only lasted a few years, and then that went out. And um, in Britain, you had a number of magazines start up. Most of them didn't last too long, but one that really got going and really made a big splash was New Worlds. I have a copy of it here somewhere, <laughs> um, so I can't show it to you because I can't find it, but I do have a copy of New Worlds. Anyway, New Worlds got started in the late 1940s, about the time of fantasy and science fiction and galaxy, and New Worlds kept going strong through the end of the 1960s, and during the 1960s, the editorship was taken over by Michael Moorcock, who started buying a lot of very experimental fiction and st basically started the whole new wave. Unfortunately, most people don't like experimental, and New World struggled, and, and it eventually um, reduced its publication schedule and then went down to just a, like a once or twice a year paperback um, original anthology of New Worlds. And, and then in the 1980s, it died out. It has been revised just recently by PS Publishing. So far, they've only published one issue. We'll see where that goes. Um, but that one is a very famous magazine that published a lot of really, really great science fiction. So after the dreaded battery break, to change the battery, I get back to it. Um, succeeding New Worlds, right about the same time that New Worlds was publishing its very last editions of the, of the paperback version, a new magazine got started in Britain called Interzone. And I have here, I just received a copy of issue 106 from April 1996. I got it because it's a special issue with J.G. Ballard and has a story and, and I believe a, an interview with J.G. Ballard. 
And this is this again is a bed sheet size magazine, really big. And um, they published a lot of the very best science fiction, especially by British authors, through the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s. They actually kept publishing regularly all the way up until 2021. And more recently, I have not heard from them. They seem to have ceased, which is very unfortunate. I mean, Ian Watson, a lot of American authors publish stuff over there. A lot of, a lot of your uh, cyberpunk authors published in Interzone. It was a great magazine. And I, and I, I really hope they can find a way to, to continue it because great magazine. Um, but before that, before you had Interzone come along, there's another magazine came along in, I believe, 1977. And it was able to get a strong start because of the strength of who was lending his name to it. And that is Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine. And these are two recent issues of it. This one's the most recent. This is still in publication. I have been a subscriber. Right now my subscription has lapsed. I want to subscribe again because this this is the latest issue. I mean, Alan M. Steele has the, the cover story. Um, others that are in this story are Tom Purdom, Lavi Tidar, R. Garcia Robinson, Gregory Foss. I mean, some of the best of today's writers and Asimov's has consistently published a lot of the best writing since late 1979. When, when it got started, had the had Isaac Asimov's name and, and photo on the cover, but it had stories by the likes of Jack Williamson and, and um, you know, all the, all the top authors. And, and they published stories like um, Enemy Mind by Barry Longyear. They published all of his Circus World stories. They, they published Samto Sukaritko, all of his Mall World stories. Um, just huge, huge number of, of great writers that came out of the pages of Isaac Asimov's. John, John Kessel published there. Um, uh, pretty much everybody that was anybody in the 1980s, 1990s published in Isaac Asimov's. It really was a great magazine, as well as publishing Isaac Asimov himself. His last two or three robot stories were were published there. His uh, he published excerpts from his his last Foundation novels in in uh, Asimov's and Harlan Ellison published his screenplay to the never made Harlan Ellison version of I Robot. He took it and published it in Isaac Asimov's when he couldn't get Hollywood to go forward with it. Serialized it, and that was that was awesome. And that magazine is still going. You can find it. You can I I go to Barnes since I'm not a subscriber. I'm still going to to Barnes and Noble to get Asimov's. And actually, they do have a new issue out that I have to um, find time to go to a Barnes and Noble and pick it up. great magazine and still in publication and still publishing wonderful stories uh, the magazines made science fiction you know it, if after H.G. Wells science fiction probably wouldn't have gone anywhere as a genre if it wasn't for these science fiction magazines and the magazines gave a place for these young people to publish their stories and hone their talents and become professional authors. There was no way any of these authors could have gotten published by anybody else because they just weren't good enough when they started out. But they were able to publish in these science fiction magazines and they were able to hone their craft and they were able to become really good authors and publish some really great science fiction stories and fantasy. Don't forget magazines like Unknown and Weird Tales and 
Um, Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone magazine during the 1980s was great for for fantasy. Um, magazine of fantasy and science fiction has always been the best place to find good fantasy. Fantastic for many years was an excellent place, especially for sword and sorcery stories. And, uh, you know, the, um, in the 1980s came along, late 1970s, 1978 came along a magazine called the Omni Magazine. It was a slick magazine. It was published by Bob Guccione, the owner of Penthouse, and it was every bit as good as slick and perfect and professional and colorful of a magazine as Penthouse. It just lacked all the skin. In place of the skin was science fiction and science fact by, again, a lot of the very best authors and scientists and that kept going into the 2000s and then it became an online magazine until it finally died and the anthologist Ellen Datmo she got her start as an editor working for Omni yeah I don't know if she worked somewhere else before Omni but that's the earliest I know of her is when she started working at Omni as fiction editor and, and now she's fiction editor for Tor.com. And, uh, you know, that's a recent development in, in the genre magazines, is that there are a lot of online magazines, um, some good, some bad, some hidden, hit or miss. Um, Uncanny has been one of the most successful. They've been winning a lot of Hugo and Nebula awards in the last couple of years. Strange Horizons has published some really good fiction and lots of really good interviews. And uh, Galaxy's Edge is a paper magazine and online and um, ebook magazine that you can buy. Clark's World is another one. I believe it's now entirely digital. And another one that has published a lot of great fiction in the last um, I think 10 years that it's been going and um, so a, a lot of new magazines have come along that have made a big splash by being purely digital and, and you have publishers like Tor doing their Tor.com short story originals online which isn't exactly a magazine but kind of achieves the same thing that the science fiction magazines used to do it gives an outlet for authors to do shorter works and get them presented by a big publisher so that people um, will see them and, and read them because short stories are a great great art form if done right there's a lot of bad short stories but don't let those bother you because remember Sturgeon's Law 90% of everything is garbage But the magazines have a rich history of publishing a lot of the greatest work. And in, in my opinion, continue, I continue to find really great work in the traditional magazines and in the new magazines. They are um, an important part of the history of how science fiction has gotten to where it is today and fantasy and horror. There are a lot of authors that just would never ever have been heard from if it wasn't for the genre magazines. H.P. Lovecraft, Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein, Arthur Clarke, you know, more recent authors like Neil Asher and Greg Egan and, you know, a lot of them got, a lot of them got their start in the magazines. The magazines have been struggling, and who knows if they'll, if there will continue to be magazines in the future. That depends on how we communicate and how we do things as a society. If the magazine will continue to be viable, but for me, I'll, it, I love these things. I love getting the new magazines. I love the artwork. I mean, artwork online is cool, but there's nothing like having the actual thing in your hand, and. Um, 
if I take care of this, it's going to last. I mean, I've got magazines that are, that are older than my dad, and they're still looking pretty good. My dad is now buried. He died in May. Um, the magazines that were published before he was born are still in my hands and still looking great. Actually, I only have the one amazing stories, but you, you get my point. Um, they, they do hold up if you take care of them. Even the crappy pulp magazines, if you take care of them, you can get some really beautiful issues of them and, and hang on to them. And they're, they're a great part of history. But they're also a place where a young writer that nobody's heard of can get their work published and become known. You know, it's, it's really, really, really difficult to get Random House to publish your novel. Okay. It's not exactly easy to get into the magazines either, but it's definitely easier than getting Random House to pay attention to your novel. Because you can write just a little short story and put it in one of these magazines. And, and if you do a good job on your story, it'll get noticed. It'll, it'll propel you towards being able to... It'll propel you towards building that name you need to be able to go into Random House with your novel and get them to publish it. Um, that may ch that situation may change, but in the past it's the way it was done. You know, the the novels, the science fiction novels, were first serialized in the magazines. You, you almost never had novels go straight to print, go straight to book. They were almost always serialized in the magazines first, and then they came out as a book. And a lot of the authors, too, they, they weren't able to get the attention of book publishers until after they'd spent five, six years publishing shorter works in the magazines. Philip Dick, he published tons and tons of short stories from 1953 until 1956 when he published his first novel. All he published before that were shorter works in the magazines. So... They are a great, re they are a great stepping stone for new authors and a great resource for people wanting to try out different authors. I mean, you can you can buy the issue because you know you like Alan M. Steele, and then there's all these other people that maybe you've heard of. I, you know, R. Garcia E. e. Robinson. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, I've seen his name, even though I've never heard his name. I've seen his name in the magazines going all the way back to the early 1980s, and, and I remember he's written some really wonderful stories. So I'm looking forward to that one, too. But Sandra McDonald, I don't know who she is. Um, Lavi Tidar, I've heard of. She's one of the newer writers and has gotten a, a little bit of attention, but I don't really know her work. Um, but Tom Purdom, Gregory Foss, I've heard of them. You know, there's a wide variety of authors in here. Some I've heard of, some I haven't. I can give them all a try and see how I like them in a way that, I mean, there's going to be some... Chances are you pick up a single issue of a magazine. There's going to be one or two works that you really, really do like, maybe even one that just blows your mind, and the rest of it's going to be just okay. Probably none of it is going to just be yuck. But a lot of it is just going to be okay. Because Sturgeon's Law. Um, there are cases where single issues of science fiction magazines have published nothing but classic stories. Stories that would go on to become classics. But those are the exception, not the rule. Usually you, usually you have one or two stories in the magazine that, are, that really excite you. And the rest are just okay. But for the low cost, and you get new issues every... Well, these are... Most of them now are bi-monthly, but you get new issues all the time. It's a... Uh, It's a painless way to get introduced to some authors that you've never heard of. You know, you can you can buy the issue for 
the author that you have heard of who most likely isn't going to disappoint you and then read all those other stories of authors that I mean if you had to pay $25 for their latest novel and you never heard of them you're probably going to be a little skittish about doing that but if you're only paying $8.99 and you get all these different authors great artwork at least one author that you are pretty sure you're going to like um, for only $8.99 and if you subscribe for a year you're paying less than that it's win-win it's the best way to introduce yourself to a lot of new authors. And then when they come out with their new novel, you'll go, oh yeah, I read them in Analog, and, and there's that, this one story, and it was a really cool story. I got to pick up their novel. And now you, it's less of a risk for you to, to pick up their new novel and read it. You'll probably love it. So the magazines are worth it and worth worth keeping around, worth continuing to subscribe to and pay attention to. It's worth to keep that going so that young authors can have that vehicle to get their foot in the door and get their career going and hone their craft like the early authors did. So, okay, I'll get off that topic and let you go. This has been a long one. Thank you. I, if you stayed this long, thank you. <laughs> From the bottom of my heart, thank you for sticking this one out. This was a, a subject that I felt was really important, and, and I felt I really needed to clarify a lot of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about all these different authors and their publishing in this magazine and that magazine. You need to know that these magazines are a rich tradition and a huge part of the history of our genres. And so I hope that is a help to you. And I hope you will check out some of the magazines. If nothing else, I mean, Strange Horizons is free online. They've got a lot of good fiction, too. Go check them out every month. I think you'll like it. And I think Un Uncanny, you can buy Uncanny. Um, I think you can still get a print issue. I know you can get it as an ebook, but they release each issue in two different parts for free online. I don't think you get all the content of the magazine online, but you get all the stories. So, I mean, and, and that you don't have to pay for, but if you want to support them, you can subscribe. And uh, they are publishing a lot of Hugo and Nebula winners right now. So, um, they're worth supporting. They're worth checking out. It's worth your time to read these magazines. Add them into your list. You don't have to buy if you don't have to buy every issue. You don't have you don't. It would be nice if you could subscribe, but you don't have to subscribe. You don't have to buy every issue. You can you can pick and choose the ones that are most interesting to you. Um, it used to be difficult to do that. Living in Racine, Wisconsin, distribution was kind of spotty. So there'd be a lot of months I'd be looking for the new issue of like fantasy and science fiction, and I wouldn't ever see it. I don't know if, if other people bought it out right away or if it just never came in or what, but there were times I wouldn't see the magazine on any of the news stands around town. And so I would miss those issues. And I missed a lot of good issues of those early, you know, uh, you know fantasy and science fiction. I bought my first issue with the October 1978 issue. and. Um, I missed the November. I got the December 1978 issue, which has a really cool David Hardy cover. And uh, the 1979, I was able to get a hold of about half of the issues for that year. I mean, it, it was difficult. And so ultimately had to subscribe because otherwise I was missing out on a lot of great stuff. Fantasy and Science Fiction was the first to publish in serial format Lord Valentine's Castle by Robert Silverberg. You know, and I miss parts of that because of the poor newsstand support for that magazine in the city of Racine back then. But things are a lot better now. It's a lot easier, you know, going to Barnes & Noble and these are always there. Well, I shouldn't say always. The, the December... 2022 analog had a Larry Niven and Steve Barnes.
different story that I really, really, really wanted. And I went into Barnes & Noble in December and they had the September-October issue. No November-December issue in there. So then I went back in January and they had the January-February issue. Wait a minute, what happened in November-December? I missed it. So I went online and find, found somebody selling it. They had it in new condition, but they shipped it to me in the winter, mind you, to Wisconsin. So actually, it was, it was April, and we had a rainy April in Wisconsin. And they, they wrapped it in cardboard and paper well enough, but they didn't wrap it in plastic. And the stupid postman set it on the edge of my porch where it was sitting in the pouring rain. So the whole thing was totally waterlogged. I put it under some other books and, and you know, wrapped it in a towel and put it under some other heavy books to dry it out and flatten it. And it saved it pretty much. It, it's in okay condition, but I mean, this was a brand new copy and I should have gotten a pristine copy of it, but because of weather and the postman and poor packaging, it got severely damaged. And fortunately, I mostly saved it. But that's what happens when you don't subscribe. <laughs> um, you take those risks. Probably the most exciting issue of Analog I've seen in the last year, and I wasn't able to get it at Barnes and Noble, and well, I had already subscribed, hoping to get it as my subscription. But for some reason, my subscription didn't start until the March-April issue of 2023. So I missed November, December, and January, February. Anyway, the magazines are are great, and the source of a lot of great science fiction, fantasy, and horror, and really worth keeping alive and, and checking them out. Find, find it, you, I'm sure you can find at least one of the magazines that has what you love. I'm going to put an end to this now. It's getting really long. I'm getting close to an hour. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you'll like and subscribe and come on back for more. And until then, um, I'll just keep producing more and keep reading my magazines.